even in this whole situation, he is still worthy. And we just give him all the glory and praise. We are made for community. We serve a God who is community, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We value worshiping God together. We value helping people find their way through life. Uh, we value the gospel. We value um, seeing lives transformed by the gospel. Uh, we value community. We value relationships. Uh, we value God's word. Um, and we really, really want people um, to see those values lived um, and experienced in the context of relationship so that everyone feels like this is a place they can call home. Good morning, uh, once again, Anchor Point. So glad to be with you once again in this way. Uh, if we haven't met before, uh, my name is Josh. I serve as one of the pastors here at Anchor Point. Thanks so much for uh, joining us in our online service from wherever you're at across the Northland. Really glad that you're here. Um, I have a few uh, announcements, sort of housekeeping items um, before we begin our service. First of all, uh, you should have received in your email um, a, an announcement about uh, outdoor services that are coming. And that announcement is also on our social media platforms, it's on our website, and on our Facebook page. And we are so excited to offer outdoor services very soon. Um, so secondly, uh, with regard to um, caring for our community, one of the things that we've done as a church is make masks. Um, we've partnered with Essentia Health in this way. And the latest uh, that I've received as far as update regarding that is that we've received um, almost 300 masks that you have made so far. And there are still kits um, that are available. Um, and I wanna make sure that I have these announcements correct so you can come and um, receive those or get those at our um, locations and make those and continue to turn those in if you have a sewing machine. So thank you for the way in which you, Anchor Point, uh, are loving our community in this way during this season. Uh, I wanna talk to you about a little bit about what you can expect this morning uh, as we begin our service. Um, we're going to sing a couple songs together. And this time is a time to you know, reflect. Um, it is also a time for you to sing if you'd like. The words will be provided on the, the bottom of the screen um, for you to sing along. Um, then we're adding something new uh, this weekend to our service. Uh, Jill Bruno, our children's ministry director, is going to speak to our little people, to the kids. And she's going to speak to, to them about uh, the, serve, the, the message on 1 Thessalonians that we'll be hearing later. And so we want to add this because we know there's little people in our homes. Um, and we... Uh, would encourage you to um, listen to that, even if you don't have kids in your home. This is a part of a church family here. And so that she's going to take about five minutes to do that. And then after that will be the message. And then finally, after the message, we will have one final song um, before our service ends. Some of you might be wondering about communion. Uh, this weekend, what I encourage you to do is after the service is over, um, Partake in communion together. Take five minutes and reflect on the cross. Reflect on the work of Jesus Christ for you. And then uh, go on with your day. And I hope you have a wonderful day.
Good morning, Anchor Point kids. My name is Miss Jill, and I want to give you a little lesson on this book of First Thessalonians. Many of you have been listening to the pastors here at Anchor Point as they've been teaching about First Thessalonians, and I just want to give you a little bit more insight into it. So to start off with, this word, Thessalonians, is a little bit strange word. So we're going to try and say this together, OK? You ready? Here we go. Thessalonians. Very good. That's right. Now, the reason why this book of the Bible is called First Thessalonians is because it is named after a city called Thessalonica. Whew, that is another funny word, isn't it? Let's try and say that one together, okay? Thessalonica. Very good. All right. So this city of Thessalonica is a major city. It was a capital city. How many of you know what the capital of Minnesota is? That's right, it's St. Paul. And just like St. Paul is the capital of Minnesota, Thessalonica was the capital city also. And that meant that it was a really busy city. So there was lots of stores and people and just very busy, busy city of Thessalonica. Well, the story that we're going to learn about is about Thessalonica and Thessalonians. And it all starts with the man named Paul. Now, Paul is a missionary. That meant that he traveled around and told people about Jesus. And so Paul went with his friends, Timothy and Silas, and they went to the city of Thessalonica. And when they went there, they went and told people about Jesus. You see, the people in Thessalonica did not know anything about Jesus. They did not know that Jesus came to the earth and was born, that he lived a perfect life, and he did lots of teaching and miracles. Jesus never thought or said or did anything wrong. He was perfect. And at the end of his life, he died on the cross for our sins, and he rose again three days later. You see, the people of Thessalonica had never heard about Jesus, and they had no idea that they could have a relationship with Jesus and God. So Paul and Silas and Timothy, they taught the people of Thessalonica that if they admit that they were sinners, if they believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again three days later, and if they call upon him to be the boss of their life, they could have a relationship with God. And do you know the same is true for you? If you admit that you are a sinner, believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again three days later, and ask him to be the boss of your life, you can have a relationship with God too. So just like Paul and Tim, Silas and Timothy were teaching people about Jesus while they were there in Thessalonica, some of the people believed and asked Jesus to be the boss of their life. And that was very exciting. But do you know that there were some people that did not believe and they were very, very angry. In fact, they kicked Paul and Timothy and Silas. They kicked them out of town and would not let them come back to Thessalonica. And so Paul and Silas and Timothy went on to some other cities and told more and more people about Jesus. But some places they went to, people believed and asked Jesus to be the boss of their life. But other cities that they went to, people got very, very angry. And one time, Paul had to run away super quick to get away from a very angry mob. And so there was a little bit of time that Paul was separated from Timothy and Silas. But eventually, the three guys got back together again. And when they did, they talked about all the people that they had met on their journeys, and they talked about what God was doing in the city of Thessalonica. And when Paul heard about the believers in Thessalonica, he was so excited and he wanted to go back to Thessalonica and teach them more and more things about Jesus and about God. But it was not safe for Paul to go back to Thessalonica. So you know what he had to do? Paul had to write a letter to the people of Thessalonica. Now, how many of you have some letters around your house? 
Yeah, how many of you have letters that are 2,000 years old? Oh, that is an old letter. Well, do you know that the very letter that Paul wrote to the believers in Thessalonica, you have at your house? It is in your Bible, and it is the book of 1 Thessalonians. Isn't that cool? God did a very, very special thing for us in order to keep that very letter that Paul wrote, kept it safe so that we could read it and we could learn the same thing that the people in Thessalonica were learning about. So, one of the things that I would like you guys to work on this week is the, the this week we are gonna be reading 1 Thessalonians 4 and verses 11 and 12 are really cool verses. And so I would love it if some of you guys would write out parts of 11 and 12 or all of 11 and 12 and use your very best handwriting and make some very pretty pictures for me with those verses and mail them to me here at the church. And I will get those letters from you and it will make me so happy. And I might even show some of them in some of my next videos. All right. The other little assignment I have for you to do this week is part of the lesson that we're gonna be learning from Pastor Josh has to do with working with our hands. And you guys are all such good hard workers. And I have a challenge for you. I would like you guys to work on coming up with something you can do with your hands this week. I know that around our houses, the weeds are starting to grow, or the driveways might need to be swept, or there might be some other stuff around your house that you can do to work with your hands. And that was the same principle that Paul was teaching the people of Thessalonica, that it is very important to work with our hands. So you guys, give that a try this week, okay? And I look forward to getting your letters. Thank you so much. Hope you have your Bible uh, with you. I want to invite you to open it to 1 Thessalonians. Uh, we've been in this series for a number of weeks now, and I think it's appropriate, uh, before we look uh, at our precise text, to step back just for two minutes to see where we've been in this series. As we've discovered so far, the New Testament letter to the Thessalonians is written by the Apostle Paul in response to Timothy's report about the Thessalonians. And this was, report was, as we've learned, was like a release valve to Paul and Timothy's and uh, Silas's distress that they had for the Thessalonians. And in chapter 1 to 3, it tells us what was so positive about this report. In this section, we discover that the Thessalonians' work of faith, their labor of love, their steadfast hope in the Lord remained firm. It was not floundering. We learned that they had become imitators of Paul and the Lord so much so that they had become examples to imitate. They'd been sharing the gospel, not only with those in their city, but throughout their entire region in Macedonia. What's more, they had turned from their idols to serve God. Uh, they'd been waiting patiently for the Lord's return. They had accepted the word of the Lord um, as not from men, but actual the word of God. And so we, we look at the front half of that and say, man, what a positive report. And we might naturally conclude that uh, the Thessalonians really didn't have any growth areas left in their life, that they were complete. But Paul gives us a clue that that wasn't true. In his prayer for them at the end of chapter 3, uh, we see a picture that, that they had still room to grow. In fact, he prays that their faith would increase and that Paul would actually be able to come back to them and help them grow in their faith and what was lacking. And this prayer of Paul serves as a hinge in the letter, a transition from the first part of the letter, chapter 1 to 3, to the back half of the letter in chapter 4 and 5. And in chapter 4 and 5, where we're at now in this series, Paul addresses the areas of growth. And last weekend, we heard um, from Craig 
that there was this repeated call to holiness, that God called us to live our lives holy before him. And as we continue now, Paul picks it up from there and calls the Corinthians to love one another and to walk honorably in their personal lives before outsiders as a witness and and as a demonstration that the gospel had really taken root in their life. And it demonstrated that they really belonged to Jesus. And so now, if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, opened it to 1 Thessalonians, let's take a look at what Paul um, says to them, beginning in chapter 4, verses 9 to 12. Here's what he says. Now, concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that is indeed what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Now there are two sentences in this paragraph. Sentence one is verses nine, verse 9 to the middle of verse 10, and it speaks of the Thessalonians' love for one another. And sentence 2 begins at the end of verse 10 and goes through the end of verse 12 and speaks about walking properly before the lost world in which they were living. And what we discover is this, is that both our love for one another and our lives together is the greatest apologetic for our faith. So take a look at sentence 1, verses 9 and 10. Now about brotherly love, you have no need to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And that is what you are doing to all the brothers who are in every place in Macedonia. Now, what should grab your attention about this description and this statement is that Paul says about brotherly love, they had no need for instruction. That's remarkable. I mean, who would not want to be a part of a church whose culture is described by loving one another so well that not one sermon had to be written on informing how to do that? But this is the case for the Thessalonians. And notice who taught them to love like this. It's interesting. Take a look. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. That's interesting, isn't it? Because I thought Paul, Timothy, and Silas brought the gospel and demonstrated this love. That's true. But what Paul is pointing to is that this love did not originate with Paul himself or Silas or Timothy. But this love, this brotherly love, originated from God himself. So when? Be a natural question. When, was the, when did that happen? Now to get at that, we have to leave this section of scripture just for a little bit and go back to where this originated. So if you have your Bible, I just want you to flip, take a left and go back to the Gospel of John. John chapter 13. John chapter 13. The context here is that Jesus is speaking to his first disciples not long before he went to the cross to suffer for their sin and purchase their forgiveness. And he says to them this in verse 34 of chapter 13. A new command I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. The command to love one another, as we know, was a hallmark of Jesus' teaching to his original disciples. Loving one another 
originated in this God kind of way, originated with Jesus himself, who was God in flesh. And his call to his original disciples to love each other was to love each other in the same way that he loved them. But here's the question. It begs the question, how did Jesus love them? With what kind and quality of love did Jesus have for his disciples? Part of the answer, we've got to be clear, is it is not some vague, catch-all, arbitrary, I don't know, subjective, free-to-define-for-ourselves kind of love. I mean, many today, they, they want to define love through their own like, personal lens. But as we're going to see, this kind of love that Jesus says, I have for you, and you're to demonstrate to others among you, is the most pure kind of love. We get a picture of Jesus' love for us, for his disciples, like you and me, in Romans chapter 5. You don't have to turn there. But here's what Paul says. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps maybe for a good person he will dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him, that's Jesus, from the wrath of God. So, Paul's point here and what Jesus is talking about in this love that he has for his disciples is that while his disciples were still weak to overcome their sin, while they were ungodly and still dead in their sin, deserving the wrath of God, at the right time, Christ went to the cross for them. To purchase their forgiveness of sin. Pay for their sin. Christ justified them with his own blood. And consequently, you're going to be saved from the wrath of God. This is what Jesus says. This is how I've loved you, disciples. Paul, in verse 7, adds to this backdrop of this love. He says, very few people will die to save the life of anyone, even a good person. But God, through Jesus, loved us so much that when we were totally depraved, dead in our sin, having zero righteousness, objects of his wrath, his enemies, Christ died for us. That's the way God loved us. That is off the charts love. And Jesus says to his original disciples, a new command I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. <laughs> this free and gracious and merciful demonstration of love is the kind and quality of love that we are to bend out to one another. You lay down your life for the other person, even and especially your enemies. To do that, you must be willing to humble yourself and empty yourself and take the form of a servant in the same way that Jesus did for us. It is a love that is willing to lay down your life if it means someone else lives. This is the love that God taught his disciples and they in turn were to give it to one another. And what makes Jesus' command here so not command new is not so much that it's just new. It's, it's that his disciples had never and would never witness a love like this before. They've never experienced it before. And then in verse 35 of John 13, By this all people will know that you are my followers. You're my disciples. If you have this kind of love for one another. Bend this love out to one another and so prove to be my disciples. 
So here's the point. Your love for me, my love for you, believer to believer, is the greatest apologetic to our faith in Christ. It's a winsome love designed in the course of time to serve as an attractant to the outside world to come to Jesus Christ and experience God's great love for them through Him. Now, now, let's turn back, let's take a right back to 1 Thessalonians again and read this verse in verse 9 once again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9. Now about brotherly love, you have no need to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God, there it is, to love one another. So through Paul, Silas, and Timothy's love for them for one another. They demonstrated this, but behind it was the instruction of God himself, Jesus Christ. And in so doing, the Thessalonians were proving to be disciples of Jesus. Now what's more, I want you to take a note, take note of the, sh- the sheer magnitude of this. Take a look at the scope and the reach of their love. It says, and that is what you're doing. You're loving just like Jesus told his disciples to love. To all the brothers who are in every place in Macedonia. That is remarkable. Because Macedonia is no small region. Let me attempt to paint the picture for you. So suppose you were to survey a straight line from, say, here in Duluth. So this is Duluth right here, right there. You draw a straight line west to Fargo, and then you go straight north, another line, to the Canadian border, and then you work your way east across the northern border of Minnesota, across the northern part of the Boundary Waters, all the way to Grand Portage, and then you work your way back down um, through Two Harbors and back to Duluth, and if you can envision that size region, that's about the size of Macedonia. And Paul's saying everywhere in this region, every believer is loving like Christ loved. That's astonishing. Can you imagine everyone obeying the single command to love one another the way Jesus loved them? Every believer loving one another that way. Every single one of them across Every place in the Northland, Silver Bay, Grand Rapids, War Road, Roseau, The Range, here in Duluth, Proctor, everywhere. What would happen? What would the outward world see? I think they would see who the disciples of Jesus really are. And it would be attractive and say, what is it about the kind of love that you love this way amongst one another? Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about God's love for you. Our love for one another is the greatest apologetic to our faith in Jesus Christ. But sadly, we know this isn't always the consistent case among believers, is it? Even across the Northland. You know, too often, there's more fighting and bickering and gossiping and slandering and division, then there is love, believer to believer. And listen very carefully. When you and I, if we ever engage in that unloving act toward one another as believers, we are blatantly disobeying Jesus. And in so doing, we bring destruction to our credibility as his disciples. And the outside world looks at our love for one another. You're no different than me. You guys talk behind each other's back. You bicker and fight. There's no difference in your love. Isn't it true that the easiest thing for us to do is be upset with one another sometimes? Hold a grudge. I mean, what is it? What is it about that? We don't have to work at that. The truth of the matter is it's our pride. It's our sin. It's our flesh. Anchor point, 
We are called to strive to be like the Thessalonians here in our love for one another. And there are so many countless ways. I hear it all the time when people come. Gosh, it's a great how this community just loves one another. It's attractive and it's won me here. We're doing so well in so many ways. But here's the thing. That does not mean we've arrived to perfection. In the same way that it had not meant the Thessalonians had arrived, which is the reason for sentence two. Take a look at it. Middle of verse 10. Paul says, but we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. <laughs> that Paul is urging them has the obvious implication that loving one another, even as Christians, must be worked at. It's not always easy to love one another, even those who are in the Lord. Like, me as a husband, my wife can tell you, he, he's not always easy to live with. He's not always easy to love. Your roommate, your kids. But it's in these less easy times that we learn and we're reminded, I've got to love him. The way Jesus loved, sacrificed, gave himself for me as a demonstration of love, I'm going to bend it out to my fellow brothers and sisters. So like the Thessalonians needed to be regularly reminded, so do we. So each day, we should ask ourselves, and throughout the day, what's more important to me as a believer? Obedience to Jesus Christ by loving my fellow brother or sister in the Lord, or disobedience to Christ by giving in to my pride, my selfishness, and my sin. Anchor Point, listen, our witness as a church to the world hinges on how we answer and apply that question. Let's keep doing. Let's keep loving the way we're loving. Because what attracts the outside world to the church, Paul says, is our love for one another. But now, Paul begins to shift again. Let's keep going. And he says, do this more and more. And now, to aspire, he says, to aspire to live quietly. And to mind your own affairs. And to work with your hands as we instructed you. So that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Here Paul is building his case on being a good witness to the world. He's saying that while the Thessalonians, you guys are loving one another, it's a great witness to the gospel, your day-to-day -day lives must also reflect that you're his disciples. Now, it's important here just to pause for a minute and to frame this part of Paul's letter in proper context. The Thessalonians had believed, like most believers in the first century, that the return of Christ was going to happen at any time, actually in their lifetime. And some of the Thessalonians took this to mean, for example, hey, I should quit my job and just like maybe sit myself up on my roof and wait for the coming of the Lord. I'm going to develop a rooftop ministry. Quit my job, all aspirations gone. I'm just going to wait it out until he comes. What Paul is arguing here in this section is that the best way to get ready for the coming of the Lord is to live quietly. Manage your life well and work hard at your job. Aspire to live quietly. In other words, this word aspire is make it your aim. Make it your ambition. You have ambitions in your life. I have ambitions in my life. You know, maybe you're a college student. Your ambition is to get good grades or maybe you want to uh, improve your health. We all have ambitions and aspirations. But Paul says the one aspiration that all of us should have as we wait for the return of Christ is that we must not only have great love for one another, but we must resolve to live quietly. What does that mean? It certainly does not mean don't speak or cheer at your kids' sporting events. It doesn't mean be silent about the message of the gospel. 
Living quietly here means to rest. Christ is going to come. I know this. I'm going to trust that. And I'm going to be calm. A calming presence before others. It could literally mean, this, this live quietly could literally mean calm disposition or posture as you go about your daily tasks. This, is, of course, is linked to what Paul says, mind your own affairs. The command here, mind your own affairs, is not in opposition to loving one another. Paul here simply means to make it your ambition to manage your own life well. Look at your own life. Is it in order? Is it in control? From our bodies to our bills. All of it contributes to our witness as followers of Jesus before the world. And so, manage your life well. What attracts outsiders to the church, to Christ, includes this. And he also says, work with your hands. In other words, Thessalonians, don't go to the rooftop and quit your jobs and wait for the return of Christ. No, resolve to live an industrious, productive life. That's the best way you can wait for the return of Christ return of Christ. God has created us not to be idle. He has built in all of us a need to be productive and to work. This is why those of you who are retired, you get restless. It's because you need to retire to something, not just sit idly in the lazy boy. This is why high school students begin to think about what they want to do for a career and why college students well, eventually figure it out. Though figuring out all of that, I know it's hard and it requires conversation and prayer. The point is we're built to work. The goal is so that we're independent and positioned best to love one another and meet needs. Now, there were people, let's be clear, in the first century who were widowed or without work. Many in our church right now, as a result of COVID, have been put on furlough or have lost jobs. You talk to any one of them, they will say, I want to work. I want to earn a living. Many people right now are looking hard for work. The desire is there, but the opportunity isn't. Some are sick and they're unable to work. This is a, that's a different issue than what Paul is dealing with here. As much as it depends on you, work hard as you wait for the Lord. Love one another well. To be a Christian means to love one another like Christ loved us. It means to live a quiet life, not a silent life, but a life at peace. Because we know in whom we've believed and we know he's coming back. And to manage our lives from our bills to our bodies and to work hard. That, Paul says, is how you prepare for the second coming. And as you're doing that, it is a great witness to the world. Anchor point, be encouraged. We're doing this. But as you know, we always have room for growth. So my prayer is that we would keep our hands to the plow. Not look back in our love for one another. Keep moving forward. Live a quiet life. Live at peace with one another as much as it depends on us. Mind our own affairs and work hard to the glory of God. And we eagerly wait for his return. Let me pray. Father, thank you that you've called us to love one another. Jesus, you demonstrated that for us by going to the cross. And I pray that we, Anchor Point, as Anchor Point, would bend that love out to one another every day as a witness that we're, we're your disciples. We're followers of you. We've been saved. We've been born again. And that as we await and wait for, long for your return, may we live quiet lives 
at peace. May we tend to our own affairs, keep our lives in order, and may we work hard as a demonstration that we are your followers. We love you. We give you glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. into our lives right now in a time of trauma and stress and anger and animosity. God, we just pray for your hand over all 
of your people and all of the people who are suffering right now. We pray for protection over our state um, and our leadership. God, we just, we call to you in these times of just fear. We just pray that in all of this destruction, God, that you rise up and are known and are seen as our Redeemer. We pray for our Anchor Point family. Um, Just give them strength as we continue to endure just a stressful season, thing after thing after thing. So God, we just, we pray that we lean on you in these times um, and in times of joy that we don't forget that you are there in all of it. In Jesus' name we pray, 